Deuteronomy 15 and 16. We're going to work our way through most of those two chapters, but to get us started this morning, I'm going to read chapter 16, verse 11. It'll give us a taste of what we're going to be talking about this morning. Deuteronomy 16, 11. Here's what it says. You shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant, the Levite who is within your towns, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are among you at the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name to dwell there. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this word. Thank you that you have ordained our joy. We, we confess that we substitute what you have given to us for the temporary um, false pleasures of this world. But we don't want to do that anymore. Jesus, help us to find true joy in you. Make yourself real in us, to us, to our senses, to our minds, so that we can rejoice in the way you designed us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. The stretch between January 1st and late March, early April, to me, is the hardest part of the calendar year. And I don't know that it's just because it's winter and cold and dark and dreary and you don't see as much of the sun as you wish you did, although I know that's a big part of it. But I think it's also because it's just not broken up by any holidays, right? You have Thanksgiving and you have Christmas at the end of the year, and then you don't have anything again until Easter, right? And I like holidays. I like celebrations. I mean, I know you got like St. Patrick's Day and things like that, but that's a second class holiday as far as I'm concerned. So, so you don't have any really big holidays, any big celebrations. And celebrations are important. And even, even if you're not a person who really gets a whole lot out of calendar holidays, I think you'll agree once you spend time thinking about it that, that celebrations are important, that you like celebrations. So if it's not holidays that are a big deal to you, you like celebrations that take other forms. You like being together with family members or friends. You like guys' nights out. You like having the girls together. You like having your family together. You like things that are fun and celebratory, right? That's how we were built. We were built to love celebrations. We all crave celebration. We were made to celebrate. We were made for joy. And that's one of the things we see pervading through these chapters of Deuteronomy, that we were made to rejoice. We were made to celebrate. The joy of joining God in his eternal celebration is what we were made for, and it's too great a thing for us to keep to ourselves. This invitation to join God has to be shared. So we're going to be talking about that this morning as we go through this. Remember, Moses is, is giving a series of final addresses to the people of Israel before he dies. That's what Deuteronomy is. It's, it's the, the, the collection of those addresses that he gives to Israel before he dies and before they enter the promised land. Last week, if you remember, we saw the centrality of rejoicing. If you look back, for example, at chapter 14, verse 26 of Deuteronomy, you see the rejoicing there. You shall eat there before the Lord your God and rejoice you and your household. Rejoicing is central to uh, what Israel was supposed to be. Rejoicing is central to who the people of God are. And we're going to see that theme built out and talked about more in our chapters today. We're going to see the theme continued. And we're going to see some of the prescribed celebrations that are meant to catalyze that joy for God's people and see how they apply for us um, uh, too. So we're going to talk, first of all, about the invitation to join the celebration. We're going to talk about a growing understanding of the celebration. We're going to talk about inviting others to join in the celebration. Those are my, uh, my, my main points that I'll be using to organize my thoughts today. All right. The joy of joining God in his eternal celebration is too great to keep to ourselves. The invitation must be shared. So to begin with, we're going to talk about the invitation to join the celebration. And to see this, we're going to look, uh, jump ahead to chapter 16 first. We're going to look at Deuteronomy 16 first, and then we're going to come back to Deuteronomy 15. Okay? In Deuteronomy 16, what we see are three of the major feasts of the Israelite calendar year. And if you remember from... It's been almost a year ago now when we were in Leviticus chapter 23, we saw all of the seven holidays, all the seven feasts of the Israelite calendar year. So a lot of this in Deuteronomy 16 is a reiteration of what you could read about back in Leviticus 23. 
Uh, but here, it's interesting, Moses selects only the three major feasts for which the Israelites were expected to travel to, as he says over and over again in these passages, the place where God chooses to place his name, which provisionally in the history of Israel would be the little town of Shiloh, where the tabernacle was erected, the Ark of the Covenant was, the priests ministered before the Lord there, but which would eventually, of course, be the city of Jerusalem where the ark eventually came during the reign of David and where the temple was eventually built in the reign of Solomon. So for those three feasts, the Israelite males at least were called those three times a year to come to that place and to worship. And those are the three feasts that Moses talks about here in Deuteronomy 16 as a way of summarizing the whole calendar year, the whole feast schedule. And so we're going to walk through those one by one. The first is the feast of Passover and unleavened bread. The second is the feast of weeks. And the third is the feast of booths. So consider, first of all, how Moses speaks about the Passover in Deuteronomy 16. Look at verses 1 through 8. Deuteronomy 16, 1 through 8. Observe the month of Abib and keep the Passover to the Lord your God. For in the month of Abib, the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt by night. And you shall offer the Passover sacrifice to the Lord your God from the flock or the herd at the place that the Lord will choose to make his name to dwell there. You shall eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat it with unleavened bread, the bread of affliction, for you came out of the land of Egypt in haste, that all the days of your life you may remember the day when you came out of the land of Egypt. No leaven shall be seen with you in all of your territory for seven days, nor shall any of the flesh that you sacrifice on the evening of the first day remain all night until morning. You may not offer the Passover sacrifice within any of your towns that the Lord your God is giving you, but at the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell in it. There you shall offer the Passover sacrifice in the evening at sunset at the time you came out of Egypt, and you shall cook it and eat it at the place that the Lord your God will choose. And in the morning you shall turn and go to your tents. For six days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day shall be a solemn assembly to the Lord your God. You shall do no work in it. This is the Passover and unleavened bread. We remember, of course, the Passover is the reminder of God's deliverance of Israel from slavery in Egypt. And it's one of the more poignant reminders of it. You remember the first Passover where the Israelites were told to take a lamb, each of them, for their families and slaughter it, right, and, and, and paint the blood on the doorposts and, and lintel of their doors because this was corresponding with the final plague on the people of Egypt where the, where the angel of death was going through the land and, and slaughtering the firstborn. This is God's divine judgment on Egypt. God said to them, you have taken my firstborn son, I will take your firstborn. But every time God, every time God announces a divine judgment for sin, he also announces a means of escape. And so as he, as he announces that the death angel is going to come through and destroy the firstborn of Egypt, he also says, here's how you can escape this punishment. And he speaks of the Passover lamb. And so in commemoration of that, the Israelites were supposed to celebrate this every year, slaughtering the Passover lamb and remembering, remembering how God rescued them from slavery in Egypt and how he brings judgment on his people. But more than that, how he provides deliverance how he provides salvation. And then following that, of course, is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, as Moses says here, that runs for the week following. Uh, and, and they're not supposed to eat any leaven, any yeast. Uh, initially, the reason for that is because it was a commemoration of the fact that they had to leave quickly from Egypt, right? They didn't have time to leaven their bread. But then it becomes something else as time progresses too. And, and yeast and leaven then become a symbol of sin. And so the removal of the leaven from the household and the removal of it from the dough is a symbol of the fact that God's people are supposed to assiduously work to remove sin from their lives. And so Moses is reminding them of all of this. By observing the feast, then, the Israelites were remembering their past redemption by the Lord and their rescue from Egypt. But then as you trace the Passover through redemptive history, you see it become something even bigger than, than those things, doesn't it? We remember, of course, that the Passover becomes one of the ways that the New Testament writers will speak of Jesus himself. Paul will say, Jesus is our Passover. Jesus is our Passover lamb sacrificed for us. And then we go back to the story of that first Passover in Egypt and we think about the lamb whose blood was spilled so that the people could be saved and it all fits together, right? What a poignant reminder it is to us. And then, not for nothing, but that's the Passover feast that Jesus uses to institute the Lord's Supper, isn't it? 
So that whenever we celebrate communion here, which here at Little Church is something we do once a month, it's usually the second Sunday of the month with some exceptions. But whenever we celebrate communion, the Lord's Supper, we also are remembering those things. And as I like to remind you, I probably remind you of this at least every other month, if not every month, I remind you that one of the things that Jesus says as he institutes the Lord's Supper at that Passover meal is he says, I will not drink this cup again until I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And so the Passover, which becomes the Lord's Supper, becomes in itself a symbol of a future feast, a future celebration. So here we have this continuum of celebration that stretches from Israel's ancient history as they come out of Egypt through what they're supposed to observe as they go into the promised land and all the way into the future where someday we will join Jesus, our Savior, our Passover who was sacrificed for us. We will join him in the final celebration. All of that, you see, is wrapped up here. This is one of the joys, brothers and sisters, actually, of of tracing these lines all through Scripture. Because it's not just something that you read about in isolation here in Deuteronomy. These are things that have implications all through the pages of Scripture. And that's, again, to recover some of the ground we talked about last week, why you have to be immersed in the Scriptures so that you can find those connections and you can see how it all works together. So here's our first celebration, the celebration of Passover, and the final fulfillment of that, the celebration in the kingdom of God, which we are invited to take part in. Then we have the Feast of Weeks, which he talks about in Deuteronomy 16, 9 through 12. Follow along with me while I read those verses, Deuteronomy 16, 9 through 12. You shall count seven weeks, begin to count the seven weeks from the time the sickle is first put to the standing grain. Then you shall keep the feast of weeks to the Lord your God with the tribute of a free will offering from your hand, which you shall give as the Lord your God blesses you. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant, the Levite who is within your towns, the sojourner, the fatherless, the widow who are among you at the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell there. And you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt and you shall be careful to observe these statutes." The Feast of Weeks gets its name from its reckoning. Obviously, it's supposed to be seven weeks. Uh, here he says, following the time when the sickle is first put to the standing grain. If you go back to Leviticus 23, you'll see that there's also a Feast of first fruits, which Moses doesn't bother to mention in this context. But, but, but there you see it's seven weeks from that period. Those things correspond. Um, and, and because of that timing, because of the seven weeks, and seven times seven is 49. And then the next day is when the Feast of Weeks happens. In, in Greek, the term 50 days, 50th day is what? Pentecost, right? And so the term Pentecost that we read about in Acts is the, the Greek term that was used to, to, to refer to this festival. And one of the things that happened over time is that the Feast of Weeks came to be understood as a celebration not just of harvest or of new beginnings, but of the fact that Moses went up to Mount Sinai and brought back the law. It was the, you know, the, the rabbis, by the time of the first century, connected the timing of Pentecost with, with about the time that, that Moses went up to the top of Sinai and communed with God for 40 days and came back down with the stone tablets of the law. And so by the time Jesus and and the apostles are on the scene, that was their understanding of Pentecost. Pentecost was a commemoration of the giving of the law. And so then when you read the story of Pentecost in Acts 2, you begin to see how Luke is showing the parallels between those two events, right? Just as Moses, the first lawgiver, went up Sinai, so Jesus, the true lawgiver, ascends not a mountain, but into the true throne room of God. Moses went to the top of a mountain where God temporarily dwelt. Jesus goes into the true temple of God in heaven, right? And just as Moses comes back down the mountain, having the law of God in his hands, so Jesus, the true lawgiver, sends the living law of God down from heaven, the Holy Spirit, who indwells his people. And then even the trappings of the scenario are parallel, aren't they? So if you go back to Exodus 19 to read about the giving of the law, you read about earthquakes, right? And and the storm and fire on the top of the mountain. And when you read about Pentecost in Acts 2, you read that the house that they were in was shaken, right? 
And fire appears in Acts 2 as well. But interestingly, the fire in Acts 2 doesn't just appear in a remote setting at the top of the mountain from which the Israelites are separated very diligently. But the fire comes and rests on the head of each of God's people. It's a fulfillment, you see, of, of, of what Jeremiah the prophet prophesied about the new covenant. They will not, in, the, in that final day, each of them teach his neighbor saying, Know the Lord, but they will each know me from the least of them to the greatest. And so we have the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of, uh, of Pentecost. And then we have the Feast of Booths. Look at Deuteronomy 16, verse 13. You shall keep the Feast of Booths seven days when you have gathered in the produce from your threshing floor and your wine press, and you shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, the Levite, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are within your towns. For seven days you shall keep the feast to the Lord your God at the place that the Lord will choose, because the Lord your God will bless you in all of your produce and in all the work of your hands, so that you will be altogether joyful. Three times a year all your males shall appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, at the Feast of Booths. They shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God that he has given you. In one sense, the Feast of Booths looked backwards as well at God's redemption, right? The Israelites were told, and, and Moses gives more instruction about this. If you go back to Leviticus 23, you'll see the provisions that are made there. But what they were supposed to do, right, is, is collect uh, tree branches and boughs and, and, and create temporary shelters for themselves, booths. That's why it's called the Feast of Booths. And they erected these temporary uh, shelters and they lived in them for a week as a reminder of the fact that they had spent 40 years living in those booths in the wilderness. So the Feast of Booths, in one sense, is a reminder of how they traveled in the wilderness and of how God was faithful to them all through that wilderness journey. However, by requiring the Israelites to live in tents, or, or booths for one week each year, God is essentially also reminding them that they are still sojourners. They're still aliens. They're still wanderers as much as they were in the wilderness. He states that explicitly in several other places. We, we talked about this when we were going through Leviticus. So for example, in Leviticus 25, 23, God says, the land shall not be sold in perpetuity for the land is mine. You are strangers and sojourners with me. You see, it's not yours, it's mine. You're my tenants, my guests. And even later on in Israel's history, when King David is preparing to hand over the reins of the kingdom to his son Solomon, and, and he's, he's showing him all of the, 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 the supplies that he's collected, the gold and the silver and the wood, so that Solomon can use it to build a temple, which David wanted to do, but God said, no, you can't do it, so he collects it for his son, so he can do it. Remember the story? I've got to take a breath, hold on. David says this in a prayer to the Lord in 1 Chronicles 29, uh, verse 15. We are strangers before you and sojourners as all of our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow and there is no abiding. That hits hard too, doesn't it? That's a poignant statement. But it's a, right, it's a reminder, it's a good reminder. And so I think the Feast of Booths is, was meant in part to be a constant reminder of the same thing, that even though we have our houses of stone and wood that we live in and we're comfortable in, we're going to take one week and live in temporary shelters in a tent to remind us that we're just strangers here. That could be, I guess, a good justification for doing a lot of camping, but I don't like camping, so I'm not going to apply it that way. But you can if you want. There you go. Interestingly, though, while such a reminder might be considered a cause of solemnity and self-abasement, right? If you're constantly reminding yourself, I'm just a stranger here, I'm a sojourner here, there's no abiding here, you know, the natural response to that, I would think, would be solemnity and gravity and, and maybe even self-abasement. Still, if you go back to Leviticus 23 and here in Deuteronomy 16, it is clear that God wants it to be a cause of rejoicing, he says rejoice. In fact, twice in this passage in Deuteronomy 16 about the Feast of Booths, he says rejoice. Verse 14, you shall rejoice in your feast. And again at the end of verse 15, so that you will be altogether joyful. This is supposed to be a celebratory thing, a feasting, a joyful thing. And so the question becomes, what could lead them to rejoice in the reminder that they were strangers in the land? 
What could cause them to rejoice in the thought that this is all temporary? I think that question almost answers itself, doesn't it? This is all just temporary. There is a joy to be had in that. Because quite frankly, a lot of this is terrible. But it's all temporary. We're strangers here. We're waiting for a better place, a better country. Isn't that what, isn't that what the Hebrew, author to the Hebrews says? Remember in, in Hebrews 11, as he goes through the, the litany of people who were faithful to God, and he's encouraging his readers to continue to be faithful as well. And he talks about Abraham and, and, and Sarah and, and all, of these, all of these patriarchs of the faith. And then he says in, in, in Hebrews 11, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles in the earth. For people who speak it thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return, but as it is, they desire a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. This is the cause for rejoicing in the reminder that this is all temporary. The fact that this is all temporary doesn't mean that everything is always temporary, it means that we're waiting for something that's permanent. We're waiting for something that's eternal. We're waiting the final celebration. So these feasts, the three that are mentioned here in Deuteronomy, as well as the others in the more fleshed out version of this in in Leviticus 23, they all serve to remind Israel both of what God had done to redeem them and bring them to himself and what he would do for his people. He saved them from slavery in Egypt That's symbolized in the Passover. He gave them the law to guide them, symbolized in the Feast of Weeks. He cares for them in the journey of life until they come to their true and lasting home, as symbolized in the Feast of Booths. I want you to notice two other things about these feasts as they are presented to us in Deuteronomy 16. First of all, two things are emphasized that we've already talked about. First, that the Israelites were to rejoice In other words, these feasts are not just duties to be observed. They're causes for celebration. They're rejoicing. Look at verse uh, 11. You see it there, right? You shall rejoice before the Lord your God. And as we just said in verse 14, you shall rejoice in your feast. And at the end of verse 15, so that you will be altogether joyful. They're supposed to rejoice. They're supposed to find joy. And second thing that I want you to see here is that their joy in their feasting and their celebration is supposed to be done in the presence of God at the place that he chooses. So, look at verse 2. You shall offer the, pa- the Passover sacrifice to the Lord your God from the flock or the herd at the place that the Lord will choose to make his name dwell there. And verse 6. At the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell in it. And verse 7. You shall cook it and eat it at the place that the Lord your God will choose. And again at the end of verse 11. At the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name there. And again in verse 15. You shall keep the feast to the Lord your God at the place that the Lord will choose. And again in verse 16. Three times a year all of your meals shall appear at the place that the Lord your God will choose. Over and over again, Moses is emphasizing this happens at the place where God will choose, which is shorthand for saying the place where he chooses for his Ark of the Covenant to dwell, the place where the tabernacle will be, and ultimately the place where the temple will be. Which means simply this, that God is saying this celebration, all of these celebrations, all of this joy that I am prescribing for you, you don't do that on your turf, you do it on mine. He's saying everybody is invited to my place for the party. You see, come here and be with me. Celebrate in my presence. Celebrate with me and with my people. That's what God's saying through all this, you see. You're invited to join him in his celebration. That's really the the, the short and long of this. This is God's celebration. This is God's party, and we're invited to join him in it. Okay, so that's our first point. The invitation to join the celebration. Second, let's talk briefly about the growing understanding that that celebration took as redemptive history went forward. Remember, the joy of joining God in his eternal celebration is too great to keep to ourselves. It will be shared. These feasts of Israel are bigger than just calendar events. They are a training ground to teach God's people to rejoice with him. Here's what I mean. 
I think earthly celebrations are meant to teach us how to enjoy something bigger than the earthly celebration itself. I think about it this way. I like Christmas. And I don't understand why. Quite honestly, I don't understand. I don't know why I like Christmas so much. I know why I liked it as a kid. As a kid, I liked it because I got presents. And I liked presents. I still get presents, but as a 43-year-old man, there's a different thing about the presents at Christmas, you know? As a 43-year-old man, if I want something, I buy it for myself, and if I don't buy it for myself, it's because I can't afford it, and if I can't afford it, nobody in my family can either. So in other words, I'm not getting a lot of stuff at Christmas that I wouldn't get any other time, so the gifts at Christmas, they don't do it. That's not why I'm excited about Christmas, which is not to say, guys, that I don't want gifts. All right, I do. My family, you're hearing this? Don't give up on the gift. But that's not it. It's something else. And I think it's, I think it's the truths that we celebrate at Christmas, right? What do we celebrate at Christmas? We celebrate the incarnation of the eternal Son of God who took on flesh so that we could be saved. He came and lived among us to establish the kingdom. And then you have all the trappings of Christmas that just create a a festive environment, and it's the celebration, right? We celebrate, but even in that, it's because we're looking at something beyond it. We're looking for something bigger. Here's another way to think about it. Think about your favorite celebration, whatever that is. If it's a holiday, or if it's just some less formal time with family or friends, sometime when you are enjoying yourself the most, and it's celebratory, right? Maybe there's good food. Maybe there's good drink. There's definitely good conversation happening. And then think about what happens when it's over and the friends have to go home and life gets back to normal. I mean, we even have a term for it. We could talk, we talk about post-holiday blues, right? But you can experience that even just in those you know, those smaller gatherings where you're having fun with family and friends and then they have to leave and you, and you have that sense of letdown and you have that sense, if, if, you're an in, if you're an introspective person at all, you have that sense of going, surely this type of thing wasn't meant to end, right? Surely there's, there's got to be something bigger than this. Surely this is pointing to something else. And you're right, it is pointing to something else. Earthly celebrations are meant to train us, to teach us to expect a a bigger, a better, a more lasting celebration. Understand, eternity is not going to be tedious and boring. Eternity is going to be an eternal celebration of God's presence. It will be eternal joy, do you understand? Such that our earthly celebrations will pale in comparison. These are just meant to wet our whistle. These are just the aperitifs, right? These are just meant to get us excited about something that's bigger and better. It's going to blow our imaginations. You were meant to celebrate. You were meant to rejoice. And you're invited to in the presence of God. This image of celebrating with God in his presence becomes an important theme throughout Scripture. So this is what I mean by a growing understanding of the celebration. As Israel's history went forward, the prophets would talk about the day of the Lord, and one of the ways that they talked about the day of the Lord is as a feast. This idea of feasting becomes an integral part of the image of the day of the Lord. So, for example, listen to these words from Isaiah. 25, Isaiah 25, I'm going to read verse 1 and then verses 6 through 8. O Lord, you are my God, I will exalt you, I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful and sure. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food, full of marrow, of aged wine, well-refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken." This is the day of the Lord in Isaiah's prophecy. It's a day of feasting, but it's, it's, a, it's an apocalyptic day of feasting. It's an eschatological day of feasting. It's the final day of feasting when all evils will be done away, death will be swallowed up, and everybody will celebrate. You see? That's just one example. We could give more if we had time. But 
It's also true that that theology of the day of the Lord and that final feast would not be true of everyone. Not all would celebrate. The day of the Lord is also about a day of judgment for God's enemies. Hosea writes this, Hosea 9, 5 through 7. What will you do on the day of the appointed festival, on the day of the feast of the Lord? For behold, they are going away from destruction, but Egypt shall gather them, Memphis shall bury them, nettles shall possess their precious things of silver, thorns shall be in their tents. The days of punishment have come, the days of recompense have come. So it's this two-sided thing. The day of the Lord is a day of feasting, celebration with his people, but it's a day of exclusion of those who are not his people. And it's a day of judgment. Jesus picks up on this reality as he speaks to his listeners. Matthew 8, 11 and 12, he says, I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Do you hear the language of the feast? Recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. While the sons of the kingdom will be thrown out into the outer darkness, and in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Incidentally, that's also what he says about that, uh, that third servant in the parable of the talents that I started our time off with this morning. Cast him into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the good and faithful servants enter into the joy of their master. The faithless servant is cast out. So those are the images that are held up to us in the day of the Lord. Are you invited? Are you included? Are you joining God in his celebration? Or are you excluded? And so the question becomes, who will enjoy God's celebration? And to answer that, we go back to Deuteronomy 15. This is where Deuteronomy 15 fits in. And in fact, we're going to go to the end of Deuteronomy 14 too uh, and, and see uh, how that fits in as well. So look back at Deuteronomy 14 for our third point, inviting others to join the celebration. Deuteronomy 14, verse 28, through the first few verses of chapter 15, it says this, at the end of every three years, you shall bring out the tithe of your produce in the same year and lay it up within your towns. And the Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance with you, and the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are within your towns shall come and eat and be filled, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands that you do. At the end of every seven years, you shall grant a release. And this is the manner of the release. Every creditor shall release what he has lent to his neighbor. He shall not exact it of his neighbor, his brother, because the Lord's release has been proclaimed. Of a foreigner, you may exact it, but whatever of yours is with your brother, your hand shall release. But there will be no poor among you, for the Lord will bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance to possess. If only you will strictly obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all this commandment that I command you today. And then chapter 15 goes on and, and describes the, 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 the regulations there for, for lending and not charging interest and making sure that everybody is well taken care of. And, and, and it's interesting, in, in chapter 15, if you read it closely, in the opening verses, it says, there will be no poor among you. But then if you glance ahead to verse 7, it says, if among you, one of your brothers should become poor. And so it becomes clear that what God is saying is not that nobody would ever experience poverty, but that when poverty happens, it will be dealt with in such a way that ultimately there shall be no poor. And so the rest of, the, of chapter 15 goes on to describe, here's how you take care of your brother who's, who, who, who falls into poverty. You, know, you help him, you lend to him without interest. Maybe it even becomes so, so bad that he has to sell, him, sell himself into slavery, but if he does, then he has to be released at the seventh year unless he wants to stay with you. And so you can read the rest of chapter 15 on your own. I'm not going to spend time this morning going through it verse by verse. But I want to point out a couple of things about it in the time that we have left. The first is this. It's interesting to me that as he describes how they're supposed to care for the poor, he doesn't say, if anyone should become poor through no fault of his own, then here's how you take care of him. He just says, if anybody becomes poor. You see, we have a tendency, I think, to, to weigh situations when people have needs and go, are they deserving poor or are they undeserving poor? You know, did he become poor through no fault of his own, in which case I'll help him, or did he become poor because of bad choices? You know, he, he, he gambled too much or he sent too much money to a Nigerian prince in hopes of helping him out or something like that. Did he make bad choices? And if so, I'm not going to help him. If, he, if it's no fault of his own, then I'll help him. But God doesn't differentiate in that way, does he? He just says, if anybody becomes poor, you help him. 
And then we ask the question, what does this have to do with chapter 16? What does this have to do with this celebration idea? And the answer, I think, is, is wrapped up with the end of the chapter. Look at the end of chapter 15. After he talks about all of the ways that the poor are to be helped, the financially vulnerable are to be helped, he goes back to the idea of eating and celebrating together. Verse 20 Uh, Verse 19, all the firstborn males that are born of your herd and your flock, you shall dedicate to the Lord your God. You shall do no work with the firstborn of your herd, nor shear the firstborn of your flock. You shall eat it, you and your household, before the Lord your God, year by year, at the place that the Lord will choose. You see, there's the connection. And here's what I'm trying to draw out for you this morning. In Moses' mind, there is a close connection between how they care for the poor and the vulnerable and how they celebrate together in the place that the Lord will choose and how they celebrate together uh, throughout their calendar year in the place that the Lord will choose. Okay, It's all connected in Moses' mind. Or another way to say it is that it's not a mistake that chapter 15 with its language of caring for the most vulnerable in society and chapter 16 with its emphasis on rejoicing and celebrating are back to back. They are linked in this way. Moses is transitioning smoothly from speaking about how to care for the financially vulnerable to talking about giving generously the flocks and herds, a sacrifice that would have been shared with the Levites and eating and rejoicing and celebrating with God. How are these linked? How are these ideas linked? That's what we've been saying. Joining God in his eternal celebration is something that's too great to keep to ourselves. It's an invitation that has to be shared. In other words, God's people are those who are so impacted by God's generosity that they have to share it with others. They're impacted by God's generosity, and so they celebrate and rejoice in chapter 16. They're impacted by God's generosity, and so they share it with others in chapter 15. And once you see it that way, the connection and the application for us becomes clear, doesn't it? God's people are those who are so impacted by him that they share how they've been impacted with others, whether that's materially, with money or finances, or whether it's spiritually, with forgiveness. You know, This is why Jesus is so serious about forgiving each other. What does he say? If you will not forgive your brother from your heart, my Father who is in heaven will not forgive you. He's not saying by that that you have to earn God's forgiveness by forgiving others. He's saying if you're the type of person who is stingy with your forgiveness of others, it probably means that you've never experienced the forgiveness of God. But if you've experienced the grace and forgiveness of God, you'll be generous in forgiving others. If you've experienced the generosity of God toward you materially, you'll be generous with others. God has invited us to join him in his eternal celebration. And that joy, once we see it, once we are impacted by it, is too great to keep to ourselves. We will bring others into it. The invitation must be shared. The good news is that the invitation to join with God in the celebration that he is planning at his place is still going out. Listen to these words from Revelation. I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. And it was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. The celebration, the final celebration, the eternal celebration to which all of our earthly celebrations point is still waiting for us. It's going to happen, and we're invited to join him. So here's my final exhortation to you. If you have never experienced the joy of the Lord at all, and I don't mean if, you've, if you don't experience it constantly. I don't experience it constantly. Most of us don't experience it constantly. But I mean, if you've never experienced it at all, if you don't know what it means to find joy in the Lord, I invite you to receive this invitation with joy. God wants you in the place where he has chosen to set his name. He wants to invite you into his presence in Christ to rejoice with him. Jesus has shed his blood so that you can enter into his joy with him. So my invitation to you is the same as that of the evangelist in Revelation. Come, 
celebrate, rejoice with the God of the universe. And to you, brothers and sisters, you who have already accepted this invitation, my exhortation to you is to be the type of people who share the invitation with others. Share the invitation with others. Do it materially, if that's how God has blessed you. But do it spiritually. Do it in terms of sharing the truth about Jesus, sharing the invitation to the eternal celebration with others. Be like, be like Mike. Use your opportunities to tell people about Jesus. If that's something that you want to do and you're not sure how to do it or you feel confused about it, let's talk. Let's work together to find ways to do that. We need to help each other be faithful about sharing that invitation with others. The joy of joining God in his eternal celebration is too great to keep to ourselves. This invitation must be shared. So I invite you to take a moment now in silent prayer and reflection. And then we're going to sing one more time this morning about the celebration and the joy waiting for us in our eternal home with God.